I thought maybe we should speak about uh, the idea of Hanukkah, but in, from a different point of view. Because, you know, Hanukkah is an opportunity for Jews to remember how proud we should be of being Jews. We got used to be just ordinary people. We go to work, we, you know, we, we do whatever we do, but we forget. It's, this, is one, this is where the problem begins, that we forget how lucky we are. But think about it, from billions of people out there, Hashem said to the Jews, the only one I care the most, not that he doesn't care about the Gentiles, he cares about everyone, even the animals, everyone. The ones that I really care for and are the most precious to me are the Jews. It says in the Torah. If he wouldn't say in the Torah, everybody can say whatever he wants. You don't have a source inside the Torah. <laughs> it's just talking, you know. When we say something, we have to back it up from what the Torah said. The Torah, the prophets, the Gemara, we have to have a source. It's in at least four different places that I remember on top of my head. Now the Torah said to the Jews, you are my children, I chose you from all the nation to be mine. Do not imitate the Gentiles. Do not behave like them. Don't call yourself after the names. Do not uh, intermarry them. You know, you're not allowed to marry other nations. You have to stay among yourself. There's, there's verses inside the Torah that shows that the Jews are very important. Plus, it says, You're going to be a special nation with special abilities, which others cannot do. We're not talking about physical abilities. The Jews don't have any physical ad- abilities. If anybody is bad about physical abilities, are the Jews. They're not good athletes. They're not strong. <laughs> Here and there you hear about a Jew that is very strong. But Jews will never be in the best uh, basketball game, uh, the team, the best uh, soccer team, the best boxers. No. The Jews, well, you know, if anything that the Jews are good with is with their head. Nobody ever contrib- contributed more to humanity than the Jews in physics, in medicine, in uh, computers, in high-tech, in everything you want. Almost everything you do and touch in, the, in a technological world, it's made in Israel, the Intel, the other companies, Microsoft, the software, the hardware, everything is, everything is invented in Israel, or by Jews around the world. All kinds of computer software against virus, the McAfee, the other one, it's all Israel young guys. Some of them very young. They develop something, they sell it to this big company for a few million dollars. The company makes billions over it. And the world benefits from it in everything, in medicine and in many other things. But we don't care about this so much. It's important, I'm not saying no. We care about spirituality. When Hashem refers to the Jews as a special nation with special abilities, it means spiritually. You have direct connection to me. You don't have any of the nonsense like Son of God and all these cults that believe in all kinds of things. You have a direct connection to me. And what does it mean? Uh, If you follow my condition, you follow my uh, restriction, my my orders, in order for you to become a special nation, rule number one, you have to listen to me and to do everything I say. Now, in this world, it's not enough only to believe in God or to kiss the mezuzah and to feel I'm a proud Jew. No. You have to actually do. If you do not do, I always like to give this example. It's like write, typing a word and Microsoft Word, typing, 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 whole book. Then you have to send, send to, the, to the editor, you know, to publish the book, let's say, on the, on the Internet. You did everything. Instead of pressing send, you press delete. Well, that's exactly a person that is a Jew in his heart. He knows what needs to be done. He may love God, kiss the mezuzah, he see religious people, he likes them. I mean, here and there he hear a few words of Torah, it inspires him. But he lives, in everyday life, he lives like a goy. He eats whatever he wants. He speaks the way he wants. He doesn't have any, any guideline, nothing. Somebody like this is actually in the worst situation on earth, the worst. Because he's worse than someone who doesn't know anything. A Jew that was born in Russia or in a kibbutz in Israel, that all his life he never knew anything from Torah and does not keep anything, is not as bad as this guy. Why? This guy knows, he loves, he knows what needs to be done, and he does nothing. Let's call what the Torah says, Mezid. Everything that he does, he does on purpose. Someone who doesn't know, it doesn't mean he's dismissed from the punishment and from his responsibilities. But his category... It's called Shogeg, not Mezid. 
he doesn't do on purpose, he, he doesn't do because he's ignorant, he doesn't know anything about Torah. However, his main problem, somebody like that, someone who was born in Russia or in, in a kibbutz and he never heard about Judaism, anything in his life, his main problem in life is why you ignored everything around you. You had many, many things around you that uh, prove completely that there's a creator, there's a purpose to this world. People speak about Jews all over. Why didn't you inquire what's going on? That's his main problem. Why you did not come to learn? If you would come to learn, you wouldn't become a murderer. You wouldn't become a, a thief. You wouldn't become, a, you wouldn't marry a Goya and your kids are Goyim. You would, it wouldn't happen to you. The reason that it happens to you, either you did not know that it's, it's not allowed, or even if you knew it's not allowed, you didn't take it serious. Big deal. What, Christine is not as good as Miriam? Come on. She's a nice girl. She respects me very much. She comes from a very important family. Uh, you know, just the daughter of Clinton just married a Jew. Everybody is jealous with this Jew. Look at him. He's the son-in-law of Bill Clinton. He's the most miserable person on earth. If he only knew what punishment he's going to get for every second he's living with her, he wouldn't smile at all. He's very miserable, but he doesn't know it yet. That's the point. Someone who was falling from the Empire State Building and they told him, don't worry, there's water in the bottom. You fall into the water, relax. So he's, well, he's happy. Oh, what's the problem? Just when he's on the 50th floor, somebody takes his head out of the window and says, they fooled you. It's really no water there. You're crashing. What happened to him from this moment? He begins to scream like crazy. What happened a minute ago? How are you doing over there? Very nice, beautiful weather up here. Not knowing that you're going to crash doesn't change reality. It doesn't change reality. The Torah said to the Jews, you're not allowed to intermarry. Not allowed. What are the reasons? I can give you a whole 10 hours lecture about it. There are reasons for that. In case you thought that because the goyim are bad, the answer is not true. Even if they're the nicest in the world, you're still not allowed to marry them. They can be the richest. They can be crazy about Jews. They can be righteous goyim that love Israel very much. And there are plenty of those, believe it or not. In America, many that believe and want to help Israel. And everything, they donate money. I see them all the time. I speak to them. I get emails from them. Believe it or not, if anybody wants to help giving out CDs for the Jews to become religious, I think I have more going that are interested to help me than Jews. Jews that I made religious, they forget me after a month. No gratefulness, nobody, almost nobody. I don't want to say nobody. I say almost nobody. Nobody cares. Nobody thinks, oh, I have a responsibility. Somebody help me. Maybe I'll help him to help others. But they, many of them, without even asking. So what do you see? Even though they're nice, even though they're righteous, even though they love God, even though they do not worship idols, whatever the case may be, it's not my decision. God told me you're not allowed. Whether I know the reason, whether I don't know, it's irrelevant. First he told me you're not allowed. Now what comes the next step? You want to learn why? Come and learn. It's of course, you have many of books and they explain everything. In general, you have to know that it's more because of a spiritual reason than physical reason. Why? The Goyim can be handsome, we can be handsome. They can be rich, we can be rich. They can be very smart, we can be very smart. It's no problem. Not because of anything physical. And still, God say, do not intermarry any other nation. Why? Because you are my children and you are holy. You are holy. That's the key point here. You are holy, holy from birth. But remember, the holiness can be divided into two different categories. There's a natural holiness that a Jew is born with. Your mother is Jew, you're born with a ticket. You have a ticket for Lama Abba to the next world. But the main holiness that the Torah is speaking about is not what we think. That because my mother is Jewish, I automatically have a VIP in, the, in life of eternity. No. It's something that we have to work very hard to earn. We have the potential. If we don't materialize it, we lose. We get nothing. One example is Yaakov and Esav. Jacob and Esav, from the same mother. One funded Judaism. Comes, the Jews come from Israel, from Yaakov. His name was changed to Israel. The other one funded the Nazis. Haman, the Nazis, Amalek, all the evilness in the world came from him, from Esav. 
What was his end, Esav? In the, in the end of his life, his head was chopped off by the son of Dan. Dan had a son, his name was Hushim. Hushim ben Dan. So uh, Esav was an uncle of this Dan. So the son of Esav's nephew killed Esav. He was deaf. He didn't know what's going on. In a funeral, he chopped his head off. His head rolled into Me'arat HaMachpelah in Hebron, where all the fathers are buried, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, his head rolled in. But the body stayed out. Why? Why Hashem directed his head into the Me'arat HaMachpelah, but his body out? To show you, in the head, he knew all the truth. He grew up in the house of Yitzchak. You need a better teacher? Same house he grew up, Jacob grew up. Jacob sat and learned Torah. He went to yeshiva for 14 years of... Uh, of uh, Shem Ve'ever, Shem is the, really the first Hebrew. Even though Avraham called in the Torah, Avraham Ivri, but Shem, it's the son of Noah, ten generations, actually nine generations before Abraham, Shem was the first righteous person after the flood. Besides Noah, Shem was the only righteous person in the world. And whoever came from Shem, it is oh, right away automatically is better than all the rest of the Gentiles. And because somebody hates a Jew, his name is anti-Semite, because we came from Sam. That's why they call anti-Semite. But really, with all the respect to Sam, the credit of who we are goes to Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, not to Sam, not to Shem. Even though he had yeshiva, you may ask me, what yeshiva? It's before the Torah was given. It's 4,200 years ago. The Torah was only given 3,300 years ago. 3,320 so that means 900 years before the Torah was given, there were people who learned Torah. What Torah? Different Torah. Without this historical story, without history, without, it talks about the, the creation of the world. It talks about the seven laws that the Gentiles has to keep. Remember, there was no 613 yet. Only seven laws for all humanity. Now you may think, big deal, how many years you have to learn to know seven laws? I have news for you, years. If you know how much you have to learn for these seven laws, there's a lot to learn. If you take everything that was written in Jewish books in the last 2,000 years, just about those seven laws, you'll be amazed how much was written just about those seven laws. And also the punishments and the reward of the goyim, of the Gentiles, is different than to the Jews. For instance, a Jew that, a Jew that steals, what's his punishment? No jail, no execution. He has to pay double. Whatever the amount is, he pay double, he pay the fine, and he leaves. They warn him, do not do it again. They give him Musar, the rabbi is in a court. But technically, there's nothing you can do. You cannot keep him an hour. He pays the fine, and he leaves. It's already a punishment. You stole a million, now you have to pay two million. You hurt yourself by losing a million dollars. It's an educational punishment. By the Gentiles, if they steal, the Torah say they have to be executed. How? They don't have a religious court that follows the Torah. Their courts is man-made uh, laws. All the laws of the Constitution of the United States. Yeah, they took a lot from the Torah. But in general, all the laws they make about real estate, about uh, uh, life, about jails, about everything, it's all man-made religion, uh, man-made uh, Constitution. It's all the people set and made it up. So based on that, you cannot follow the Torah because they don't even know the Torah. The Torah says that the guy that still risks his life from Hashem. Hashem can execute that guy, and if he's going to die, it's because he steals. You, know, you may ask me, well, in that case, almost every person in the world is, is a thief today. Regardless, Jews, not Jews, most people steal. They steal stamps where they work, they steal phone calls, they cheat uh, with the UPS, they say we didn't get it, but they really got it. And, you know, sometimes they have to return something, but they don't return it. There's many ways to be a thief. Not only somebody who robbed the bank is a thief. In that case, why all the people, most of the people stay alive? It should be all dead, finished. In one week, the whole world should be executed. The answer is because Hashem, God is, is reasonable. He sees that people are so ignorant, they have no idea what they live for. You want them to die for stealing? That's why he does not execute them. But really, technically, just knowing that a guy that still needed to be executed, 
You should get him very scared from what's God's opinion about him. So you see, they don't have that many laws to keep, but the laws that they have to keep, their punishment is very severe, it's no joke. What are the other seven laws? This is before the Torah was given, it was applying to the Hebrews also. They have to believe in one God, no son of God, no statues, no the God of love, the God of the ocean, the God of the money, none of this nonsense. One God, everything goes through him directly. They have to make a system with police and courts, and they have to follow the laws that they decide. Whatever they decide, they decide, but they have to follow it. So that's the second one. Third, they should not kill, should not murder, they should not steal, they should not eat any raw animal by cutting an organ from a ba an animal and eating it while the animal was still alive. They have to first kill the animal. Even if they kill the animal, it's called nevela. What does it mean, nevela? An animal that was killed in any way, but wasn't slaughtered, which means the animal is complete, there's no holes in it. Somebody shot it, somebody stabbed it, somebody electrocuted the animal, somebody hit it with a car, whatever the case may be. A tree fell on it. Once it's a dead body, they're allowed to eat it. Jews are not allowed to eat it. Muslims copy a lot from the Jews. Muslims also don't eat. <coughs> they only eat something that was slaughtered. The difference between Muslims and Jews, that Muslims do not have the oral laws. They do not know that the information that God gave the Jews in Mount Sinai, which they admit, was really 99% oral laws and 1% written law. The world recognized the Torah. They do not know about the oral Torah. That was the trick that God tricked them by giving us the written Torah. But really, 99% of Judaism is the oral Torah. All the laws, you cannot follow one without the oral Torah. If you follow literally what the Torah says, everything you do wrong, everything. You cannot keep one mitzvah in a real way without the oral law. For instance, the Torah says that you have to slaughter the animal. Where to slaughter? It doesn't say. With what knife? It doesn't say. To check the knife that it's smooth in the sun, make sure there's no bumps? It does not say. It does not say, in general, what you do right after you slaughter. Once you open the stomach, you open the animal to two halves. The, the Torah doesn't say to throw a lot of, uh, of salt to get rid of the blood and the, and the urine of the animals because there's gallons of urine inside the stomach of the cow. There's tons of liquid. If you don't throw the salt right away within 72 hours, it begins to absorb inside the parts of the body. And that's, by the way, the reason why non-kosher meat is a little bit juicier or a lot juicier than kosher meat. Because kosher meat, as soon as you slaughter the animal, you get rid of all the blood and the, and the horrible uh, liquids inside the animal's body. You get rid of it. So you're eating a much cleaner and better meat. They do not get rid of it. They electrocute a thousand cows in one shot. And it takes them days until they get to the next one. It could be in a, in a place when it's very cold or in the refrigerator. It doesn't matter. By the time they cut it to pieces, it was marinated a week already in the urine and the blood of the, of the animal. And that's why it's inside the meat. So the yeah. meat is absorbed with so much liquid, of course it's going to be juicier. But juicier with what? <laughs> Who wants such steak that was marinated in the urine of the cow? You understand? Well, in India they drink the, what, the, cow, the bathroom that the cows make. In India, the Indians are fighting who's going to drink it. I don't know if you know. The cow is holy for them, you know. I once asked an Indian, why you worship the cow? He said, because the cow is like mother. In the pregnancy of the cow, it's also nine months. So I asked him, so who cares? Just because the cow has nine month pregnancy, it became holy? Because it's like a woman? What's the... He didn't really know to answer. But if a cow passed by in India, it stops traffic for hours. Nobody... <laughs> Nobody moves. So you see, like the cow is like Moshe Rabbeinu walking. They have the million alfei avdalot. That's how they treat the cow. Very interesting. The Torah warns us from this stupidity. With all the respect, they can be a professor in college and follow this stupidity. That's what happens when you don't have Torah. You follow all kinds of nonsense until in the end, you fight who's going to drink the urine of the cow. That's how, that's how it becomes.
But we have Torah, we never moved from it, it passed from generation to generation, everything is perfect. And the Torah told us about the seven laws of the Goim. If the Torah wouldn't tell us, we wouldn't know. Why the Torah told us? Because the Torah wanted us to know how it was before we received the Torah. That's how it was. So I started to say the seven laws. So one is to believe in one God. Second, to make a system, just a system. Third, not to kill, not to steal, not to eat raw parts of the animal, not to worship any idols, and to respect God, never to curse him or to behave to him in a disrespectful way. All together, seven laws, that's it. But seven laws, we see in the Torah that those who worship idols, God is very angry at them. Very angry at this going. That's, by the way, many reasons of the tsunamis, they go in the area of India and Thailand and all these China places, floods, and you see tens of thousands of people died in places that they worship idols, usually there are more tragedies. Check, check the statistic. You don't have to believe me. Check that in those areas, every tragedy, half a million people die, 300,000 people die in massive amounts. Also places that there is lack of modesty, like San Francisco, LA, South Carolina, they have hurricanes and typhoons and earthquakes. Why? Because people there are very not modest. Also New Orleans, they have this Mardi Gras parade, New Orleans, every year, that forget about the Shem Irachem. And all of a sudden you hear New Orleans, every, every house is under flood. There's reasons for this. The reason that Hashem is doing it is to wake up people, wake up, examine your life. Don't you see that this is not the right way? Some go in, wake up, some don't. But everything mainly is for us, the Jews. The Gemara says, everything that I do in my world is for my children, the nation of Israel. And the Gemara says that many of the tragedies that should have come to us, Hashem take it somewhere else for us to wake up. Why? I give you an example. If you drive on a highway and you see, God forbid, a hor horrible accident. Horrible accident. What happens to you? You get like goosebumps. <laughs> wow, imagine if I was there. Imagine what happened to me. What happened to you either way? You drive slow, put seat bell, you think about life. Just imagine I'm a father, I have a few kids. What happened if I'll be this guy you now on the bed going to the hospital? I don't know if he's ever going to be able to open his eyes anymore. This is called tshuva, repentance. By seeing somebody else's tragedy, you have to be clever enough to learn from his experience. Why to learn in a hard way, like most people do? Learn in an easier way. I see someone else's mistake, I have to wake up right away before it will happen to me. Cheating, stealing, what's their end usually, these people? The Torah says, Sovga Navlet Lia. One of the worst things, since I'm speaking to you and your girls here tonight, We cannot finish a lecture without opening your eyes a little bit to that number one obligation that Jewish lady has in her life. What do you think it is? What's the most important thing that God expects from a Jewish woman? Once she becomes 12 years old, she's a woman already, what do you think that the most important thing out of so many things in life, kindness, Shabbat, Lashonara, uh, you know, um, charity, raising children, uh, being a wife, you know, all kinds of things, kashrut, kosher, many things, not to worship idols, not to murder, from all these things. What, if you have to say, God, please me, just tell me the most important one for me, what would be the answer? Modesty. Very good. Now you may say, modesty? With all the respect, you compare it to a murder? But it's better than I'll be a murderer than not, ma than not modest. Well, what's the comparison here? Even Shabbat, the Torah says about Shabbat, Oti venu venechem, it's a, it's a covenant, it's an eternal covenant between me and the nation of Israel. Sounds a lot more bombastic than to be modest, no? But you'll be surprised. First of all, modesty, it's a combination of many sins. It's not an individual sin. If it would be one sin, for instance, a girl... She smoked cigarettes, Shabbat, she couldn't hold herself, she lighted a cigarette. One cigarette, the whole Shabbat. That's Chilun Shabbat, she's Mechalel Shabbat. Maybe less than other girls, because she's trying to keep. 
So she is, she's mechalel, she's violating Shabbat less than another Jew, right? But still, it's a viol- violator of Shabbat. She's mechalel at Shabbat, okay? So now, that's one scene. With all the problems around it, it's one scene. With a ma- major punishment, but one scene. However, there is another category. It's called chote umachti. Sinning and influencing other people to sin. Committing other people to fall. Actually, you actually a trap for other people to make the sin as well. What is it like? <laughs> a girl that walks on the street, not mad, is tight clothes, no clothes, whatever the case is, tons of makeup, hair all over, million colors on her hair, she's noisy, she attracts attention, she puts her pictures in a Facebook, Hashem Yerachem, Jewish girls, they put their face, their body half naked or naked completely in a Facebook. Millions of, of filthy and dirty people all over the world sit in on her picture and have been t- bad thoughts about it. And she did not gain anything by putting this picture. Yeah, if she gets millions of dollars for it, I understand where she comes from. She had a, an incentive to make a scene. He, for, just like that, destroying their soul completely for nothing in return. If somebody comes to you and says, listen, I want you to kill this guy. He's a very bad person. Don't worry. You kill him, it's a mitzvah. And I give you a million dollars for it. And you ended up murdering him. Not that it's allowed. It's not allowed. Not allowed to murder. Not allowed to murder Jews. Not allowed to murder, to murder non-Jews. So you're not allowed to murder. So since a million dollars is a lot of money, still, even though it's becoming nothing, but uh, you took the million dollar and you killed. Of course, you eat your heart. Wow, I became a murderer for money. You feel horrible, right? Feel horrible. But when people ask you, how could you murder? I didn't want to murder. I just wanted a million dollar. What reason a girl has to put her pictures on the internet or in Facebook, not making money, not doing anything? What is, what's the point? Ignorance. Nobody understands what a severe sin is this. But the punishment is there. The punishment is the same punishment. Hashem is not going to change the whole world just for you. You put your pictures out there, all these people who look at that, chas v'shalom, if you're married, bichlal, it's even worse. That's called chote machti. What does it mean, chote machti? Walking in the street, not modest. Every guy who looks at this girl and thinks bad about her or enjoy from her beauty and her body and everything, it's a sin for him. It's a sin for her. Equal sin for her and for him. However, it's only if there's one guy, so now her punishment is double. What happens if there's two guys? Her punishment is triple. What happens if there's 10,000 guys walking in Fifth Avenue and they all looked at her? It's 10,000 scenes in one minute. What happens if a million people saw her on television? She's a model walking in front of the whole world seeing her with the bathing suit. Now it's 10 million scenes or 10 billion scenes. I don't know how many people would watch it. For her, in one act, an act of a minute, she can get so many sins, it will take her a million years to make repentance. You understand why modesty is a, it's a real major tragedy? What do you think, that the goyim are allowed to walk naked on the street? They're also not allowed. I know somebody that when she became religious, she had clothes, designer clothes, more than $20,000, the worth of them, designers, everything, Jewish girl. American Jew. She had a question, what am I going to do with all these clothes? Can I sell them to a goyim that works with me at work? It's all beautiful, the pants, designer, jacket, all kinds of names. The answer was no, you're not allowed to sell it to them. Can I give it to them as a gift? No, it's better than throw it in the garbage. The question was, the rabbi said, who told you that they are allowed to dress like this? God hates this kind of lifestyle regardless who it is. Of course, for the Jews, it's a lot worse. This is the children of God. They have to be an example to the world. That's why it's much more severe, right? If you're the son of the president and you drive like crazy, they look at it a lot worse than just another anonymous person drove like crazy. Son of the president and you behave like this? Your father is the judge of the Supreme Court and you behave like this? Your father is a teacher and you are such a fool? People see who you are, what is your background, to know to how to rate your crime. Children of God, everything they do, it's called Chilul Hashem. Disgracing the name of Hashem in this world. 
But the most severe problem here right now is that this punishment continue to travel. The guy that looked at you, he had all kinds of bad thoughts, and he goes home and his wife get, get on his nerve, and all of a sudden he tells her, oh, the food that you cook is so horrible. How many times I told you, put spices, change the meat, change this. It's really nonsense. He doesn't have any problem with the, with the, with the food. Psychologically, he's under pressure. Why? He just saw this beautiful girl on the street, and his wife is not beautiful anymore. Maybe she just gave birth, maybe she's 20 years older, whatever the case is. And he's getting into arguments with her only for one reason, because she's not as attractive as when he met her 20 years ago, or before the, the, the delivery, right, of the baby. And the reason that he came home with this kind of mood is because of what he sees in his office. So now, eventually, his marriage will be broken, his children will become criminals because they'll be on the street with a broken house. They go into drugs. One of them become a murderer. The other one become, who knows, a bank robber. And some of them goes to jail. There's so many things. It's a chain reaction. And really, how did it all start? With you being a secretary of that guy. And really, you don't even dream. When you don't even dream that you are guilty of breaking a family apart. You're not even dreaming about, what, me? i never do such a thing. The opposite, Rabbi, if I see a husband and wife that have a problem, I try to make peace between them. Right, you're right. But you committing sins, sometimes without saying a word, sometimes without any intention. You, commit, you can commit millions of sins. i give you another example. You go to yeshiva. For girls, it's not so relevant, but for boys, you go away out of town. You have yeshiva, they give you dorms over there, you have your room. And they have to be, let's say, to pray in the morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, let's say. And you are lazy. It's hard for you to get up. You stay up at night, you're playing with your computer, with all the nonsense. In the morning, it's very hard for you to get up. If you're, if you're late to college, you pay the price. It costs you money. You're not going to graduate in the right way. You won't get the right mark. You will not become a doctor. You're actually hurting yourself. Nobody cares. You don't want to come, don't come. It's your problem. It's not like school. You don't come. They call your father. Hey, where were you for, for a few days? It's free business. You want to learn? You learn. You don't want? You fail in your test. Your problem. However, in yeshiva, it's different. Why? You don't come in the morning. Somebody else sees that you're getting up instead of 7. You, you, you're coming to the Bet Midrash, to Daven at 7.30. One day, another day, another day. What happened to the other guy? So, you know, why am I getting up 6.30 like a fool? This is the way the evil inclination works. Look at this guy, he comes 7.30, nobody tells him anything. He also gets up late. And another guy gets up late. He creates the entire shiva now goes down on the level. You start the day late, your davening is not davening, your life is not serious, there's no blessing in your life, the level of the learning is going. Who started everything? Who is guilty of everything? The first one. This is the way it works, and also the other way around. If you are a pioneer in a good mitzvah, you go to a place and they say, we want to raise money for orphans. You're the first one who jump, a thousand dollars. And all your friends wants to compete with you, what? He's going to give and we're, gonna, we're not going to give. So they all say, a thousand, three thousand, two thousand. Everything that follows you, you have a share in it. You understand? Same thing. You, you begin to inspire people about one negative things that happen in a community, like people speaking in the middle of the prayer. And you come and you make flyers and you hang them on a wall and you talk and you ask the rabbi permission, can I say two words? And you say, please, there's too much noise here when we pray. If we come to shul to talk, where are we going to go to pray? Somebody smart put a sign. If you came here to talk, where are you going to go to pray? It's one place to come to pray. If here you come to talk business and sport, who needs you here, right? So a person that starts a wave of waking up, awakening, or he makes lectures and other people learn from him and, and they also host lectures in their home or Shabbat on him, somebody like this gets benefit from everything that will happen thanks to him, even partially. Even though it's not 100% the reason that somebody else made a lecture, maybe they thought about it anyway, I just didn't know the timing. They saw a beautiful lecture in someone else. They also did it a week after. The first person benefited from the second lecture as well. 
He comes in front of God, he said, thanks to you, there were two lectures in Queens. What do you mean? I only made one lecture in my whole life. No, no. The second one you also get credit for. Why? The people were jealous that you had such a great thing. Thanks to that, they made another lecture, and two guys became religious. Come see your reward. Wow. Why the reward? Doing nothing. When it comes to Mother States, we're playing with fire, but not regular fire. It's not the fire of the Hanukkah candle. It's the fire of an atomic bomb. You understand? They're not playing with a little uh, a torch here. It's an atomic bomb, modesty. Why? Because it's rolling. It's such a chain reaction. There's no way to stop it. Where, first of all, where are you going to find all the guys to ask them apology? To apologize, you know, to apologize to them, to ask forgiveness for making them making sins. And for having fights because of you. And bad thoughts and whatever happened after that. You know, it's impossible to find. And, and the other way around, a girl that dressed very modest, and she talks about it, and she encourages her friends to do so, and she sets an example, and even though people laugh at her, and they say, what, you're primitive, what, you're grandma, what is this, you cover your hair, you're so young, you're so beautiful, you know, I'm sure that's what the girls talk between them. And she's strong, and she sets an example. In the long run, many will follow her, because in the end, the truth always wins. And this woman will get rewarded for all the sins that were prevented in the world thanks to her. Even in potential. What does it mean? Uh, Miriam affected Rachel to become modest. So of course, Rachel is dressed modest every day. Let's say she was 20. Now she was modest until she was say, 60, let's say. And, and then she went to Gan Eden. Those 40 years that she was here modest, Billions of sins, potentially billions of sins, all the guys that would look at her and it would affect so many things, it would create such a problem and all these problems were prevented. Now how do we know? We will never know, but God knows. Hashem knows. In her entire life, how many potential sins would come from this woman to the world? You credit for all. That's why it's such a great business to make people religious. To become religious yourself is a very good thing. Every day you do mitzvot, you're not making sins, you're purifying your soul, it's affecting your children, very nice. But to make others make, become religious, it's much better. Because if you have one yourself, now you have two. If you made ten, now you have eleven. The eleven has kids, they become a hundred. The hundreds grandkids will have grand-grandkids, will become a thousand. You can be already in Olam about 300 years and the numbers continue to grow. Le'avdi, like the Facebook. All you have to do is put 50 people in the beginning to make some noise. Each one of them will get an average 6, 7, 5, 10. Eventually the list have a million people. You did nothing. What did you do? You put some good things in the website, which if we're already speaking about it, you asked me before the lecture about the Facebook if it's kosher or not. It's depend to who. People who are ultra-religious, they learn Torah, they already keep mitzvot, they're in a high level, there's no point of wasting time in it. And even if there is great lectures over there, those great lectures are everywhere in Judaism, not only there. So don't use as an excuse, oh, I'm there only for good things. Because usually the way of the evil inclination, the Yetzirah arise to start with something positive, to get you in. Once we in, all the trash begins to come out. One thing leads to another. Commercial, this pop-up, this, this, bad pictures of people. One thing leads to another. Eventually, a year or two later, your level went down. You're not as religious as you used to, and you don't see the connection. So you may ask me, oh, yeah, somebody like you, you have two lists. In English, and I have about four or five lists. First, I did not do any of them. People are doing it for me because they want to make other people religious. I film the clips, 10 minutes short clips, and they do all the editing, they do the work, they send invitations, whatever they do, I don't know anything about it. However, you may ask me, okay, but how do you agree? Because you know there's Jews going into this place. So the answer is, those lists were not designed for religious people. A girl that keeps Shabbat, modesty, she learns to rush, she reads Tehillim, what does she need to waste time on it? What is it? What's the point? The point is for people who are anyway there. they anyway all day there. If it wouldn't be this Torah, 20, 30 minutes a day that they hear there, they would not hear a word of Torah. The fact that they're already in a list and people make comments and one send invitation to the other, it gets them in. Maybe a year later they become very religious thanks to this. It's the beginning. 
It's like I said before the lecture, there's one rabbi in Israel, he is one of the biggest today, is Rabbi Grossman, his name. He is the one who organized the games between Maccabi Tel Aviv in basketball to the New York Knicks every two years. He did it already twice. Khan, he has an organization, he takes care of kids from broken houses, he makes them religious, helps them to get married. Supposedly he's doing a very big, holy job in Israel. What is specialty in the beginning of his way, because before he became very famous and big, he used to go to nightclubs with his long beard. Long beard. He can make no mistake. You see him inside the club, you know, he doesn't belong there. Why did he go to the club? To drink on the bar? Of course not. What he used to do? He used to go to the Israeli guys in the club, and, and they all get nervous when they see the rabbi in the bar, in a place, and he used to talk to them. Hey, how are you doing? No, you enjoy this club? What's going on? Do you think that's the purpose of life? Do you think that your creator put you in this world to come to become a drinker and to come to drink, to move your body like a tree in the wind? What do you think is the purpose of your life? And then they begin to argue. What do you mean, Rabbi? You don't belong here. You don't come and tell us what to do. Go back to your neighborhood and we, drink, we live our life and you live your life. But it started like this, and he's a very pleasant person, slowly, slowly. <laughs> Obviously, you see the results today. He has a very major organization. You need to be a strong character to be able to go to these places. Some other rabbis, as soon as they step over there, they feel their entire holiness goes down to zero. Just from the impurity of the place. The drugs, the way the people are dressed, the lousy music, the bad curses that they said in the music. It's completely affecting the soul. But someone who's going with strong faith in Hashem that I'm going to save souls, what can we do? Saving souls sometimes is going into f under fire. In the middle of the war, you have to save people. It's fire shooting all over. It's a life risk. What do you think? Dealing with secular Jews, it's easy. It's a piece of cake. No, it's a lot of risks. It's affecting you. It's affecting your children. There's a price to pay. However, the Torah said that it's the most productive mitzvah for a Jew. Because it's, it's, a, it's a snowball. It's going without your control. Sometimes I, have, I go to places, somebody comes to me, comes to shake my hand. I'm religious thanks to you. I don't even know him. Never saw him in my life. Not even once in a lecture. Bechlal is from far away. How do you know me? I watched your lectures. When I was in LA. I went, somebody took me to eat dinner in a restaurant in Beverly Hills. I walked in. The whole table got up, come to me, shake my hands. We show Mer Kosher, we listening to lectures every night, this guy, this couple, this. You never know, in the other side of the world, people become religious on some efforts that we do. I'm the only one who can do it? No, every one of you can do it. It's not only to become religious, we have obligations to others, so we can influence them. But the most important thing, that if you don't save others, at least don't destroy them. The Torah say, Gadol HaMachtio Yoter Meorgo. Someone who makes other people commit sins, it's worse than killing them. Because killing them is 20, 30 years of their life and it's over. Sometimes killing a person, don't misunderstand me. I just wanna, uh, want you to understand what I'm saying here. Sometimes killing a person in the long run will, will, will eventually we will understand that we actually did him a favor. Why? If you kill him when he's 40, and if you wouldn't kill him, he would live to 70. Now he has 30 more years that he was in Shomer Shabbat. 52 Shabbos a year, multiplied by 30 years. How many Shabbos is this? More than 1,500 Shabbos that he has to pay for. Shortening his life really did a great favor for him. However, if eventually he was getting, he will become religious, shortening his life is actually destroying him. So it really depends what he missed in his life. If he just missed going out to the clubs and smoking on Shabbat and stealing in a business for another 30 years, he would kiss your hand. You know, you did me a great favor. When I see my punishment now for 40 years of life, just imagine how it would be and if I would live to 70. Of course, that doesn't give anyone permission to start being God here and to kill or to, do, to decide what to do. But in general, this is how it works. Same thing if you save a person. If you save him when he's very young, it's not like when you save him when he's very old. When he's very old, how many years he has now to keep mitzvot? Now you save him when he's young, he's 18, 16, 17, his whole life is in front of him. Everything has been calculated to the last penny here. Everything, every hour counts. 
You know, one of the greatest rabbis that make people religious in Israel, his name is Rabbi Elbaz. He has 200 different institutions of Kirov, for boys, girls, kindergarten, shiva, shiva for Bali, shuva, synagogues, mikveh, oh, so many things. I don't know if he remembers himself the list of the 200 institutions that he has. When he, a story about him is, at one time there was a Moroccan guy that came from Morocco. And the Moroccans, when they came to Israel, they hardly spoke the language. So they went to work in the field, farmers. So an old Moroccan guy is going, is working in construction or in the field. And there was one, one rabbi, his name was Rabbi Cook. And Rabbi Cook, his wife was working in the kitchen. She see from the window people are working, you know, outside in very hot weather. She called him in. She saw his religious guy. She called him in to give them water or to eat something. So he came in, and she saw that while he's drinking and eating, he's very upset. So she told him, why are you sad? I see something in your heart. So he says, yeah, you know, I just came to Israel. I'm only here a few weeks. They already took away my kids to kibbutz. They put them in this kibbutz. I don't even know what kibbutz is, but somebody just told me that over there they teach no Judaism. They teach boys and girls together, everything from the goyim. I'm very worried about my kids that they become not religious. And I don't know what to do. There's nobody to talk to. They, they treat me like I'm garbage or something. That's how it was. That's how they did. The communists, the people that funded all these kibbutzim, that's, what they used, that's how they used to kidnap kids from their parents and put them in kibbutzim. And today, they are the most anti-people against religion, these kids. They grew up. They are the leaders of the movement of anti-religion in Israel. Those, many of them with history, that when they were kids, they were in yeshivot, until they grabbed them away from there. So the rabbit said, she felt very bad. She said, okay, tell me what the place, don't worry, I'll go there tomorrow. If I'll speak to your kids, they'll agree to talk to me, and maybe I'll take them out and I bring them to my husband's yeshiva. So I said, sure, if you talk to them, I believe they'll be happy to get out of there. What do they do there? So she took a bus for hours. She went there to that kibbutz. She got there. She asked the kids. She spoke to them. My fa your father told me about you, and I came to take you to yeshiva. Would you want to come with me to yeshiva, or you want to stay here? Say, no, no, we don't like it here. We want to go to yeshiva. So she took them out of there, and she brought them to the yeshiva. Who is those kids? One of them is Rabbi Elbaz. That's all. She did one mitzvah, took her, let's say, the whole day, right? Let's say the whole day she bought there, she went on a bus, back and forth, two, two hours to be there. All together, I don't know, eight hours. Whatever you want, ten hours. One day, for sure. From that day, she became the richest person in the whole world. The richest, spiritually. Trillions of mitzvot are being done every year. Trillions, maybe tens of trillions of mitzvot, thanks to that day. And all goes to her account. Everything, why? He made so many people religious. The people he made religious became rabbis that make other people religious. They have kids, grandkids. It goes constantly. Everything goes to her account. What for? For a few hours of efforts. Or oh, God forbid if it will be the other way around. If he was in yeshiva and she went all the way there to get him out of there and put him in a kibbutz, and he was potentially a big preacher that gives supposedly one day to give a lot of great lectures, and she took him out of there, she pays for all those who did not become religious. Understand how big is the responsibility of life? So since time ran out, I just want to conclude and connect it with Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the holiday that symbolizes the victory of the Haredim, the Jews who stick with the Torah all the way to the end, against the Greeks that all they care about body and physique and sport and everything external, the material world, and the Jews who joined them, the Mityavnim. The Jews who joined them were plenty. They joined them, they got good jobs in the Congress, in the government, in the authorities, they didn't want to kill us physically. They wanted to destroy our religion. It bothered them very much that these Jews have this Torah and they wait with us everywhere. It makes everybody wrong. They want to clean us from the face of the earth spiritually. Most of the Jews could not resist the temptation of the benefits that they were giving and all kinds of things. Also, they were afraid of what would happen if they won't join them. They'll kill everyone. 
everyone who refused to become like them, they killed him with cruelty. So you either with us or we destroy you, like the Muslims do today. You want to become Muslim, you'll be a hero. We'll, kill, we'll, we'll kiss you, we'll, we'll make you our dear, dearest in our, in our environment. You don't want, we're not going to let you survive. It was in their hand. In less than a week, they will destroy 90% of the people in the world. Why? Because they don't want to become Muslim. So what do you think would happen? People would be afraid. They'll all become Muslim. Some of them would stay Christians in their basements or Jews. But they would be afraid on the street to say that they're not Muslim. It's all about fear. That's, by the way, how Islam started. Muhammad went with the sword with his gang from one place to the other. I'm sure you know a little bit. You read about it. They're not hiding it. Everyone who did not want to become Muslim used to kill him. When you don't have the truth, you need to threaten people with a, with a sword or a gun. When you have the truth, you're doing them a favor to come join you. You don't have to run after them. Look at Judaism today. You know how many thousands of Christians want to join Judaism every year and they give up because the, the bureaucracy, the, 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 the process is so difficult and they just give up. Why? If it would be a mitzvah to be a missionary with run, everyone, Kadima, one, two, three, in one day you become a Jew. No. You have to prove you deserve, you have to prove that you're going to follow the, the, the difficulties, the test. What happened? A year from now you go back. We have to see if you deserve to be. By then, no, one, two, three. You say a few words, you're a Muslim. You say a few words, you're a Christian. A few words, you're a Buddhist. Jew? No, no, my friend. Come back in two years. Come back another year. Test. It's a whole process. And most of them give up. Some of them, in the end, they stay, they don't give up. But it just show you the difference between the truth and none. So Hanukkah, it's not only about donuts and candles with all the respect. It's much deeper. It's, I'm proud to be a Jew. It's the victory of the Jews who were faithful to God and had faith in Him and stayed with Him to the end compared to those who gave up religion for nonsense, for money and, and, and fame. I do not want to be in the false side. I want to be in the right side. That's Hanukkah. It's an opportunity. It's like a special ability in these eight days of Hanukkah to get closer to Hashem from this point of view that look at what's going on in the world. Everyone is a Greek. Television, sports, everywhere. It's a whole big thing. I don't want to be a part of it. I want to be different. I want to dress modest. I don't want to be top of the line. Rabbi, my car is the best in town. No, that's not what I came to the world for. I want to be different than all this show off. I want to dress like God wants me. I want to get married like God wants me, not like the society around me wants me. Rabbi, you really think that we have to do a separate wedding? Can't we do half and half? Can we do until 11 like this, and then from 11 we open up the... All kinds of stupid things that religious people say. Why? Because they're not religious. They think they are. They're not really is. Someone that loves God and is religious is going to consider to marry in his wedding with millions of sins in the first night of his life? People touch, guys, girls, hugging, kissing, dancing, moving their body, excuse my language, like animals, and thinking that his marriage is going to be successful. And all the people who eat non-kosher or even kosher without the bracha, Look what's going on today in a non-religious wedding. Once in a blue moon, Hashem with His mercy, He sends a message. Like in Israel, the entire catering place, hundreds of people fell with the floor. You heard about it, no? In the middle of a mix dancing. You can see it, it's on YouTube. You can see how it happened. They dancing, a girl singer singing bad words in a microphone, and all dancing, guys and girls hugging and kissing. They show about... 20 seconds before, and all of a sudden, the entire floor collapsed all the way down to the, to the floor, and 20 people died. It's a whole thing. whole thing. And you know what? One religious girl was supposed to get married that night in that place. And her father came to her in a dream. He passed away and said, change the place. Do not get married in that place. And in that night, all the people who were there fell like Korach and his Adato. Korach and the 250 people who came with him against Moshe, how the ground opened up and swallowed all of them. That's what happened. Hashem cannot do it in every wedding because it will eliminate the free choice. If every wedding was ended up like this, nobody will make mixed dancing. The Satan comes to Hashem and says, hey, what job do I have? 
Nobody listens to me. Everybody who makes a sin against you, right away, you destroy him. So Hashem has to keep it 50-50, free choice. That's the test. I'm testing you. But the Torah is the same Torah, with the instruction never changed. Modesty is the same modesty. The fact that all kinds of religious girls walk today like mothers on the street doesn't make it right. It's still a serious violation against the Torah. But, but Rabbi, but her husband is a big Rabbi. Her husband, excuse my language, is a fool when it comes to modesty. If he lets his wife go like this. Yes, he maybe makes a lot of mitzvot. And even her, she maybe does a lot of mitzvot. I'm not saying no. But she has a very serious violation. And between me and you, if you will be a judge in court, and they bring somebody to you, and that somebody murdered, that's what he did. He blew up somebody's head, took a baby, drowned him inside the lake. And then the lawyer show you the last 10 years how many kindness and charitable things this murderer just did. He helped this, he helped orphans, he helped things. Would you let him go without a punishment? With all the respect, lawyer, excuse me, Mr. Attorney, is showing us all these movies and witnesses that come and say how great is your client, but we, uh, we can never forget that he's a murderer. Same thing a woman that walks half naked on the street or with a $5,000 wig all the way to the floor. She could be formed from birth, and she makes a huge violation because hundreds of people every minute looking at her. Whether it's in a wedding, whether it's in a school, other, other girls so see her as a model, as an example, they copy her. And it's a chain reaction, it's a disaster. What do you think? That there's any discrimination just because she came from a good family or her husband is a rabbi, she's dismissed from the punishment? The opposite. She will get worse than others because from her, there is a higher expectation. The Torah says, Kol agadol mi chavero, Someone who is greater than his friend, he has a higher, higher uh, evil inclination, higher, because if not, where is the test? But at the same time, there's a higher expectation from him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu medakdek im tzadikim kichut ha-seara. Hashem is strict with the righteous Jews, like so precise, like very thin. The judgment is very precise, like, like an air. Hair is very thin. So the judgment does not move left and right even by a hundredth of a percent. Nothing. Why? Because from you I expect. From, him, from them I understand who they are, where they come from, but from you I expect. And the higher you get, the more knowledgeable you get, the expectation grows. Same thing like a guy goes to the gym. If you only walk up one week, the trainer give him 10 pounds to lift, not more. 10 pounds. No, no, not more. It's not good for your muscle. After a year, Give him the same 10 pounds? No. Now it's 30 pounds. Why? 10 pounds will do nothing to the muscles after a year. In the first week, it's good. Because the muscles are not trained yet. After a year, what's 10 pounds? The tests become higher and higher. After 10 years, it becomes 300 pounds. What happened here? You want to develop your muscle? There's a way to do it. You want to develop your righteousness? There's a way to do it. The more you, you grow, the harder the test will become. If the test will be the same like the first day you became religious, oi, oi vavoy, what kind of life you're going to have? It's four years being religious, don't have one challenge. What, what do you deserve a reward for? Some people are afraid. No, no, I don't want to know. Then I have to do. <laughs> it's a price to know. And it's a better price to receive the reward later on, knowing, making you doing it. Not knowing you have no chance to be righteous. Bezrat Hashem will remember this Hanukkah. Thank you to Orly for hosting that night. We'll remember Hanukkah as an opportunity for us. We're already halfway through or more. Opportunity for me first to be proud I'm a Jew. Second, to know very carefully about my obligation as, a, as women, all of you. Most important thing is modesty. Second important thing is Shabbat. If a woman does those two, 90% of Judaism is in her pocket. Remember this. Modesty and Shabbat, you are already in a very high VIP league. Very high. You don't do one of them, modesty or Shabbat, you're on the border of failing. Ah, I do kindness, I read healing, very nice. For everything you get rewarded, don't get me wrong. But you are already half, half of 
the obligation that you have is uh, you're not following. Because Shabbat and modesty is basically almost almost everything. Almost there are many other sins, but they can be corrected easy. But Shabbat is the foundation of Judaism. Without it, the Shulchan Aruch said that he's not a Jew. A Jew that's not keeping Shabbat cut himself out of Judaism. If they would know, they'll never dare to be Mechalel Shabbat. They just don't know what they do. They come to Shammai and say, I'm very sorry, give me your ticket back. You got this ticket when you born to a Jewish mother, you lost it, give it back. What do you mean, Hashem? I thought I'm a Jew. Every, every Jew has a share to the world to come. Hashem flipped the ticket and said, yes, my friend, with some conditions and restrictions apply. You didn't follow it, you lost it. As we don't want to be it. Men and women, Shabbat is equal. Modesty, for men, it's also important. Not to walk like the way some of the guidos walk in the street. But it's nothing compared to a woman. A woman attracts attention. And this is like planting a seed in the ground. One day the seed becomes a tree with tons of fruit. So making a seed by walking not modest is like planting a negative seed in the ground. It's like a tree of poison. And it's growing and growing and growing and you have no control. It's not in your hand anymore. Same thing I said in the beginning, intermarriage. A person marry a Goya, he has kids, he pays for their college, he gets them married, he buys them houses, he kills himself for them, he comes to Hashem, he says, Hashem says, you don't have children. What do you mean? I have four kids. I gave my life for them. You don't have kids. I'm very sorry. Didn't you open my book? Haba min goya karu ibna. A Jew that have kids with a non-Jew, the kids is not his. <laughs> what a tragedy. Sixty years giving up my life for four kids, and in the end they're not even my kids. But what do you mean, Hashem? Biologically, I'm the father. Yes, but who cares about the body? It's all souls. It's all connection between the souls. You have nothing. You are Jew and they're not. They go to different places. Ah, what a tragedy. And sometimes one of them will become one day Adolf Hitler. What do you think? You know how many Jews that they think that they are going fighting against us? Go to the Hamas. Half of them are Jews. I'll show you an article. Jewish women in Israel that married Arabs, each one of them brought 10 Arabs to the world. The Arabs, according to the Jewish law, they're all Jewish. And they're all in terrorist organizations in Gaza, in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia. Arab Jews, they don't know the Jews. They think they're Muslim. They have Jewish soul. And what do they do? Blow up buses in Israel and kill innocent Jews. Imagine they come to Shammai, they think I'm a proud Muslim. I go and I have 72 girls waiting for me, baloney, all the nonsense they tell them. And instead, he has a tragedy in front of his eyes. You murder your brothers. <laughs> First problem is that he just found out that he is really a Jew. Second thing is that not only a Jew, is a murderer of his own people. You understand? That's ignorance. He didn't, he didn't know. He didn't know it's reality. Go and correct now what you did. Go and correct. I always say it's better not to fill up your credit card with debt. One day you have to pay with interest and penalty. Be careful. Don't, don't max your card. Use it as less as possible. There's a price to pay later. Every American maxed his credit card. Nobody can pay it today. And they pay interest and penalty. And the credit gets ruined. They can't get a loan. They want to take a mortgage. They pay an extra 2% a year. Such suffering for making one foolish mistake, buying too much on a card. Don't fill up your negative account with sins. Keep it clean, that they don't have to suffer and sweat so much to erase it. Better to be smart, not to get it and to correct, than to get it and then have to sweat to correct. Thank you very much for coming.